Welcome to another episode of Focus on Taekwondo. I'm the host and founder of this podcast, Mark Russell. Have you ever wondered what it takes to get your black belt, win a tournament, perfect a pumse, or defend yourself in the street? Well, here at Focus on Taekwondo, we intend to help you find those answers. We interview top professionals in their field, including masters, athletes and coaches, to give you an insight into what it takes for you to be the best you can be at this modern day, ancient global martial art and sport that is Taekwondo. So today's interview is with Nicholas Anderson from Sochim High Performance Centre in Sweden. So hi Nicholas, how are you? Uh, fine, thanks. Fine. Excellent. Um, so you've just recently returned from the, the World Cadet Championships in Egypt. How was the event? Uh, to be honest, uh, I must say it, it feels good to be home, good and um, back to, to civilization. Uh, been in Egypt uh, sometimes, both for a junior world championship and some uh, other G-class tournaments. And uh, it's, it's a little sad to see that... Uh, you know the country has have a, had a lot of problems, and it it has made a big effect on the structure in the country. I think. Oh, okay. It's, it's okay. A lot of trouble with the organization. Uh, there weren't that many tourists. We were in Shark Al Shame. So uh, it was uh, overall with the team. The cadets enjoyed it. They had some good time. The competition went on smooth, but. Uh, they had some problems with with the hotel and uh, food. Some uh, one, some in the team also get uh, get ill, get uh, they were puking, maybe get some bacteria in them. Right. So it was a a mixed uh, mixed feeling. Uh, yeah. Okay. Running. And so, what age of children did you have out there then? The cadets. What what age? Just to tell the listeners. Yeah, the age is uh, between 11 and 14, but uh, most part in our team, maybe 13, 14 years okay. old. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the the event itself, as in the, the competition, um, how did your guys do? And was it the standard quite high? Um, yeah, my, my feeling, uh, and it has been like this, in this since they started with Cat at Cat at events, it's it's actually very 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 high standard. Many of the cadets actually fight almost like seniors fight. Wow. The lighter uh, and and average, I, I can see countries that spend a lot of money in in development uh, of taekwondo and uh, they they start in a much much more early age. They start to push the kids in a more early age. So some nations really they rise up. It's a big, big gap. Okay. I can, so if I take Sweden as an exa- example, we have very strict rules in Sweden. For example, it's not even allowed with head kicks for cadets. Yeah. So that means that we, we start more late to, to put focus in the Olympic sport and then to become an elite player. Uh, most of the ones yeah, we had now, they have been competing international. We have some some uh, international medals like in the uh, Dutch Open President's Cup and so on but anyway we have not been competing that many years uh, with these kind of rules and so I think the gap is, is higher in the cadet level so do you think that you'll you know Sweden will change the rules to help Actually, or do you think it's a good idea not to change the rules we need to do that. I think the whole world needs to adopt uh, since Taekwondo developing so fast and actually we put in some some suggestions for rule changes to our sports federation uh, and uh, authorities that decide things in Sweden because we need to be able to compete the same way as we fight those international yeah. and, and it's many times it's a shock for the kids. Uh, head kicks, boom, boom, boom. You, you know, you need to build in a reaction in the spine. You need to to work many, many years and then have the same simple speed. So yes, we need to change. Okay. If gonna, yeah. Yeah. So are you happy with the performance of your athletes? Uh, to be honest, overall, I think they did a good job. Uh, Excellent. They didn't expect that much. We, the closest, sadly to say, but we took a quarterfinal. It was actually very close to get medal. Yeah, yeah. Overall, good experience. It is good experience, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they'll come back stronger the next time. Yeah, of course.
because they have a uh, new thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, content. good. So, yeah. Okay, good, excellent. So, um, you know, obviously the introduction didn't go into a lot of, of who you are. So, you know, I would like you to kind of go back into a little bit of your history, your backstory, and tell us how you eventually got into the position that you're in and how you set up your high performance center and also started working with the elite side of, of um, Taekwondo and the Swedish national team. Sure. Uh, I like that kind of question. <laughs> Good. Story, everybody has a story. Yeah, definitely. My story is maybe a little special. Anyway, I, I uh, must say now I'm. Uh, I started with uh, soccer and I started with ice hockey. This is all the like the typical sports in in Sweden. I did uh, soccer like seven eight years. Was pretty good in that. Then I did also ice hockey. But at the age of fourteen, and it was very late if you look at modern times, I get into contact with taekwondo, and uh, mainly it was because it looked cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, chance. yeah, yeah. Uh, it was more the picture of martial art at that time was more street fights. Oh, you were a cool youngster, wanted to impress friends uh, and uh, get, gain some respect and blah blah blah. So yeah. that's how I actually started with taekwondo. I liked the kicks and, and the the action. Uh, taekwondo had a had a, had a tough uh, what to say image that time when you did taekwondo everybody oh this is cool like more like uh, maybe mma is now yeah yeah so uh, i started with that and directly when i started with that i find uh, I, I like the training even if it was more traditional taekwondo that time okay we did the push-up uh, on the knuckles and the hard you know remember the old school training <laughs> but, uh, what i like is what that that it was a uh, uh, individual sport and I've always been uh, very egoistic <laughs> and okay. uh, uh, for me to play play in a team uh, it didn't really fit that good so when I find out this is an individual sport I can uh, what I do is is uh, I gain results and I the losses I have or the belts I take it's up to me yeah so, good yeah, that's actually, a good point yeah and uh, actually at the same time uh, I uh, stop with the uh, soccer and, and ice hockey and even I did tennis but I stopped with everything started with taekwondo uh, that time we train in a gymnastic hall uh, small areas we were maybe 20 30 people doing taekwondo uh, we had uh, one girl doing taekwondo it was very special yeah, yeah. <laughs> kids nothing it was a sport for youth uh, kids between 14 to 22 years old mm -hmm. and uh, you know I uh, the old school I had the even long hair and I have like my hair in a special way uh, you know it was I was a youngster you know and, I'd uh, love uh, to see those pictures eh? <laughs> laugh but it, it was cool uh, and uh, what happened when I turned 19 I took my black belt and up to that time, actually, our, our club did not really. We had more more traditional training, uh, mixed with pumps and self defense and just kicking pads and blah blah blah. The club was not successful at all. We had uh, in the northern part of Sweden, we were like the third best club in northern Sweden. Uh, but when I took black belt, we were maybe 60, 70 people. Wow, it was 98, uh, and then the head instructor he decided to move to another city and uh, to, for studies okay and you know the hierarchy in uh, hierarchy system in, in uh, martial art is uh, the one with the highest belt is taking the class and yeah. taking the club no one really asked me oh, can you <laughs> be in charge of a club you know and uh, how are you as a leader no no you have the highest belt finished no discussion <laughs> So, so I was standing there, 19, didn't even know what to do with my life, finished school. So, uh, but I, I saw a challenge with it uh, and I decided now I want to do something. Uh, then I changed uh, the name of the club. It was uh, originally Schlefteo Taekwondo Club. It's a city I live in, it's Schlefteo. Okay. All the clubs that time in, in Sweden had uh, like the city's name. 
Stockholm to go on the club, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it was like a fashion. Everybody wanted to change the Korean names. Right, okay. So we changed to Su Shim, and that's another story why we choose the word Su Shim. But Su Shim Taekwondo Club, and uh, we changed logo. And uh, that time I also I looked at many other sports, and I find out one key point. If you're going to grow, we need our own facilities. We can't just be in gymnastic halls, and, because there is no really club feeling. You yeah, know? needs to be specialized there, yeah. yeah. And be able to decide when you want to have training, be able to train more and have some freedom. So we, we actually got a, got a own facilities. We get some help with the government in our city. Wow. Um, a very, very small place, 200 square meters. <laughs> uh, but it was cool. We yeah. had some place to stick it. And, uh, that that year, uh, our club, uh, the total money that went in and out in the club, I don't know really the English word, what is it? Uh, how much money that, that goes through a, a club or... Oh, the, the ter- from the people? Turnover. Uh, turnover, yeah, yeah, turnover. It was uh, 100,000 Swedish crowns, which, which is uh, around uh, $10,000. Okay. Uh, and it was increased with 100% just in the first year. Right. So for us, that was cool. The, the yeah. first year meeting, board meeting we had with the club, I uh, find out <laughs> we, we took some dis- discussion about what, what to sell. This was a, a point, a key point on the, on the agenda, on the year meeting. Uh, should we sell Coca-Cola or Fanta oh. or Sprite in the, in the cafe, the small kitchen we had, blah, blah. This was the level we had that time. Yeah. Uh, same year, uh, the, the year after, we had doubled the, the members, so we were maybe 150 members. Brilliant. Yes, and we just, uh, almost one year later, we, we become a Northern Parts best club in our area. So that was a huge celebration. Whoa, yeah. in Northern Park, we reached a new level, blah, blah, blah. So for us, a very high step. So what what year was that you set up the the? This was maybe ninety eight. I took over the club. Okay. Uh, so this was maybe ninety nine two thousand. And uh, the second step, I I decided uh, I looked at other sports. If you're gonna be successful, you need to you need to look at other successful sports. I couldn't really find taekwondo clubs that was was in that level. So I started to look at other sports. Was the key point, and the key point I find is that they have competitions. They have tournaments. No one really starts with soccer if they're only going to do the, the tactical and technical training. They need to play games. They need to go on traveling together. They need to have some, some other things that motivate them to continue. Yeah. Test them, so, yeah. And normally, in many, many sports, it's natural. If I start with volleyball or basket, I know that when I start, I, I compete. This is uh, <laughs> one important key, key point. So we started to, to bring a system that everybody that started with Taekwondo, they compete. Uh, and to raise the level, I started to compete a lot by myself. I went to all tournaments I could find out, both in th- Sweden, Nordic countries, I even traveled international. Brilliant. It was yeah. E-class e- tournaments, but I did some fighting. Dutch Open, German Open was still at that time. Just to, to send signal to the rest of the club that this is the most fun thing and also same time is education. So going from a traditional Taekwondo to, to start with Olympic Taekwondo, sport Taekwondo, for me this was an important step. So everybody when they asked me uh, who, who was teaching you Taekwondo, I, sorry to say but I, I have been teaching myself. <laughs> <laughs> visiting clubs training camps blah blah creating my own system but I think I think if you have the basics that you've learned and the traditional side then you know it's it's a it's not easy but it's easier if you've got that traditional values in a sense you know I, I think so too this is uh, maybe we, we come to this area a little later in, in the talk now but yes this is maybe even one thing I'm missing at the, at the modern time but for me it, it was a good basic uh, to have mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, what happened is that uh, 2000, 2003, I uh, ripped my uh, crossband uh, ligament, wow. uh, ACL, yeah. uh, but not 
by Taekwondo. I did it because I went back to soccer. I played soccer and <laughs> smashed it. Yeah, it's a dangerous sport. It's a dangerous sport. Yeah, dangerous. <laughs> Everybody asks, oh, Taekwondo, Marshall is dangerous. No, no, no. It's yeah. not really that much injuries if I look at Yeah, no, you're right. So uh, I uh, ripped it. This was just some months uh, when I after I did uh, my last tournament was Dutch Open. So what happened then is that I I was not just a coach that that did my own training. I I could fully focus on my students. Uh, and what happened that year when I when I had this injury, uh, the club level went whew, straight up. The members were increasing, the level of the fighting increasing, and uh, you know it was just some some years. Two years after that, we become actually the best club in Sweden. Brilliant! Yeah, it's uh, a good achievement, huh? Yeah, it became like a dream. You were thinking, oh, this is think if we can be maybe number three in Sweden. So uh, we created an elite team, and we started with kids training, adults training. Uh, we started slowly to build our center. We actually took it in four steps. We have been, you know, first step, I think, we did the building maybe 2003. We built it maybe 100 square meters more. Then it has been some steps. Uh, so everything, the whole package just was developing. And to speed up, yeah, to speed up a little now, uh, we set a dream. Think about if we someday in the future maybe can take one international medal. Just one medal at Dutch <laughs> Open or something, or maybe have one in the national team that take a medal somewhere. So if I now speed it up until we have now 2017, what has happened with the, the club development is that uh, we now have uh, 650 students. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah, we have uh, a turnover, uh, 80,000 US dollar. Uh, no, 800,000. 800, 800 right, okay. 800,000 US dollar. We take between maybe 30 and 40 G class medals every year. Uh, we have been taking around 20 European medals uh, at European Championships Cadet, Junior, U21, and Senior. They have been in two Olympic Games now. Uh, they have World Championship medals. They have Youth Olympic Games medals. We uh, have uh, 13 people working uh, and are employed by the club. That's excellent. Yeah. They have a big fitness center, high performance center now with a full equipped gym. So if I look the gym together with the Taekwondo, the Hapkido, which we also have here, mm -hmm. We have uh, 1,200 members. Um, we have uh, <laughs> we have uh, sushi clubs now in six different cities in Sweden. Okay, that's great. So uh, yeah, it has been a fast uh, fast development. Yeah, a lot of things has happened the last years. <laughs> That's, a, that's an amazing success rate. Huh? I, I never knew it was as big as that. I mean, I, I know you're a great coach and I've, I've met you at various locations and, and um, I always enjoy talking to you, but I didn't realise how amazing Soshim has become, you know? It's, uh, and Sweden, Taekwondo in Sweden has become as well. It's great. It's, it's uh, nice to hear, nice to hear. But it's, it's also normal, you know, Sweden's also... Uh, it's not uh, anyway. It's not the official sport from Sweden, so we don't see that much on on yeah. in media and blah blah blah. So it's, it, I think it's it's a little unfair sometimes that we don't have the status that we maybe mm -hmm. deserve. Yeah, but it, it's coming. It's coming slowly here in our city. You know, it's the second sport in in our city now. Okay. I mean, you, you know, from a point of view of Sweden, maybe they don't know exactly what's going on, but I think the rest of the world know. I mean, Sweden has two female athletes in the top 10 world and Olympic ranks for their weight division. Ellen Johansson, fifth place Olympic rank, fourth place world. And Nikita Glasnovic, third place Olympic rank, fourth place world. Now, that's a great achievement in itself, you know, so the world knows you're there, you know. Um, is there any other up and coming athletes you'd like to tell us about? 
Yeah, yeah this, this is also, uh, I think this is an advantage we have in, in small countries, this development I see. Uh, the mental is now spreading out. If you look at the top six in the world or top ten in the world, it's you have see a lot of small countries coming. Yeah. For us, we can never. We, we have maybe twelve thousand doing taekwondo in Sweden. It's not much. So for us to to have two athletes in the highest highest level, that just show that we have a good knowledge. We have scientific methods. We we have the ability, but we don't have the base. Yeah. So your question, uh, if we have other athletes upcoming, if I look in the future, there are a few. Uh, one name everybody in, in the world know him is is uh, Fredrik Emil Olsson. Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> been famous like <laughs> since he was nine years old. No, he he became a you know Taekwondo Hall of Fame when he was nine years, but he's still going strong. He's, Brilliant. Now 15 in just one month, and uh, but but it's too early to to predict. Will yeah. he have uh, the abilities to stay in the sport? Will he will he do this 10 more years? You know, many things happen when you grow up. <laughs> uh, but but we have a few that's also good potential to take after uh, Ellen and Keith in the future. I think. <laughs> yeah. No. Great. Excellent. So. Just uh, from your point of view of, of all the experiences that you've had with the athletes, which one memory sticks out the most and why? Uh, this is uh, not the first time I got this question. Okay. First time I find it very, very hard because, you know, you have so, you have unbelievable, so many, many memories that so, but I think if I connect to one thing that, that really sticks out a little is when we qualified for the first Olympic Games. Yeah, uh, because you know, all athletes, all coaches that's into this sport have some kind of dream to reach Olympic Games, and uh, working so many hours, so many years, living this dream. And we went to Azerbaijan. This was uh, the time before London. Uh, they had just one world qualification tournament, and then they had one regional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, Ellen, she took the spot in Azerbaijan. She qualified as the third athlete. She took position number three at the World Qualification Tournament. And, and that feeling, when we got the Olympic ticket that time, it was just a dream coming through. <laughs> we were popping champagnes all night, and you yeah. know. And, and we reached, this was like a, a checkpoint. Ah, check, now we have reached Olympic Games. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is one of the, the most memorable. Yeah, yeah. I'm, sh- I'm sure you'll have many more. Yeah. Well, that's good. So, just uh, from from your point as well, um, so not only in my eyes I think you're a top coach, but every time I see you, you look amazingly fit as well, so you obviously look after yourself. Um, so, from from other coaches and future coaches, what kind of, you know, what, what does it take? You know, I take it you must eat well, train hard, and enjoy looking after yourself then <laughs> it's a good question actually I, I said said before this podcast that I start by myself look uh, listen to podcasts mm-hmm. and this is it seems to be some kind of routine question what is your morning routine how yeah. is your and and uh, it's nice to hear that, that that you have seen this because I think that if you're gonna be able to work as much as I do, I, I think I work triple time. I've been living my life fully, fully, fully with this sport. Yeah. To be able to have the right energy to to uh, survive, to feel good, I have always put in focus the the, the health and uh, to keep in shape. But now, now the trick for me is that uh, I, since I've been an athlete by myself, I've always since I was young. This is my routine. If I'm not training. I have been always feeling bad, so this routine has been sticking there. And uh, the, the only problem is that my main goal maybe is to develop the club, uh, the athletes, the country. It, it has been set before me. So, so my physical training is mainly by by gym training. And gym training, the one that they say that, that they can't, uh, they don't have time for training. It's, it's bullshit because it's how you how you uh, you decide your own time, you know. It's a priority. You can do gym training 11 o'clock in the night, <laughs> yeah. 6 in the morning. You can do it lunchtime. 
you can do it uh, Friday night, Monday, you know, you can even do it at the hotel when you're traveling. So for me, this, this has been easy to, to stick to some kind of routine. So for me, doing the weightlifting. Uh, and uh, if I look at the weightlifting, I also, the last maybe five, six years, I, I do more heavy lifting. You know, for me, it's, it's uh, I rather do 30, 45 minutes training with really heavy weights. Mm -hmm that has made my body very, very strong. I keep in good shape. I get a lot out of, of 30, 45 minutes instead of doing this typical bodybuilding training. For example, you do one day biceps, one yeah, day no. shoulders. That, that took too much time. So now I can do one week, I maybe do two training. Next week I do five trainings. And uh, regarding the nutrition, maybe this is uh, the listeners that's young, don't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> My secret to don't get the typical coach belly because normal coaches you see most of them they've got a belly and you know not, maybe not that fit is that uh, I try to eat one time a day because when I eat I love food I uh, eat I eat I eat I eat so if I would be eating breakfast lunch uh, some nutrition meal and dinner oh, it, it's done. So for me, I actually just, I try to eat maybe in the middle of the day. Then I eat fully, fully. Yeah. And uh, I drink to keep my hunger away. I drink maybe 15, 20 cups of coffee. Okay. I need always to explain to my athletes that you can't look at the coach in this way. This is my way to balance my weight. If I would be training 15 times a week, I would be destroyed. You know, dehydrated, yeah. destroyed, no nutrition, maybe becoming sick, injured. But I feel very good. I keep my weight, and I and I since I do weightlifting, I keep my body strong. So I I have actually find a system that that's that's working for me. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, I, so the recommendation I is that everybody need to find their own system that's working, and the athletes can never. They can't copy a coach in that way because we live in our life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I listen to, um, as I've mentioned before, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and, and one of the ones I listen to is um, Starting Strength, and, and they go on about, you know, that men should lift quite heavy and, you know, not, not so much repetition, but more more for strength rather than for power because obviously as we get older, the power disappears. So, you know, the strength is important to stay there, you know, so, so it's good. And also with the, with the one meal a day, I think, I think you're right as well. I mean, the intermittent fasting where you don't eat in the first thing in the morning, it helps your body work more efficiently as well. So I think you're pretty much onto something good there. Yeah, and, and, and in the end, everybody needs to, to find a way. As long as the weight is, is uh, stable, stabilized and uh, you don't gain weight, you don't lose too much weight, and as long as you feel good, yeah. you have energy, you feel strong, then I think you find a good, you find a good system. Yeah, definitely. But too many, too many coaches, sadly. Is that, <laughs> oh, yeah, we know about them. <laughs> claim that I, I don't have time. Yeah. This is too and, and I, I don't believe in that system. Yeah. Well, so um, look, looking back on the Taekwondo side of things, um, without giving away any team secrets, obviously, well, maybe just a few, um, what kind of things are you working on with the recent rule changes? Uh, it's an interesting question. And uh, I would say, first of all, I, I think I'm now uh, 39 years old. I still see myself in the mirror. I look at the 25-year-old, but <laughs> this is the question. The thing is, uh, people ask me, what, what has the key points been for your success? And I think one thing is that I'm, I'm, I've been learning myself. You know, it's not, I don't have, I have never had another coach that have, have teach me. So since I have been so open-minded, for me, all rule changes that have happened now in modern Taekwondo, I just, for me, I, I love it. I'm not saying that I love how all Taekwondo have developed, but for me, changes. Yeah. This I love. So if you look at the older new rule changes, just uh, from, from uh, Beijing until London, they did 20 rule changes. <laughs> mm -hmm. London, James. But from Beijing now, 
Now, from London to Rio, they, they, they made uh, 20 rule changes. And, but just from Be uh, um, Rio, it was yeah, one year ago. Mm -hmm. In one year, they made even 20, I think now it's 23 rule changes. <laughs> so you see, it's, it's just wah, popping more and more. So to answer your question is, is uh, main main uh, thing now with, with Olympus. Well, I think, uh, and, and the big, big change has been uh, that they took away all kyongos, all warnings, half minus, and they added just a gamjon, uh, one minus directly. And they also increased it for, to, to maximum five gamjons, five minus points up to, up to 10. So this has been a, a very, very important thing for me to, to uh, try to minimize the amount of, of gamjons. It can feel a little, uh, to say, uh, negative way to look at sport, how yeah. to minimize punishments. But it has so many effects. You know, if the referee handle out 10 gamjons, Plus ten gamjons to that. It's twenty points that they can can uh, <laughs> uh, decide on. So to minimize the gamjons, to look what cases now that give you gamjon uh, minus point. This is one thing, and also how to use this so you can create gamjons for your opponent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You know, you can create situations. Where the opponent can punish if you're a smart fighter, and instead of sometimes you you, for me it should be normal how to search the points, you know. But we have also some electronic codes. We have two different brands. Some is some very hard to score on. So instead of just looking how do I take two points on the hogo, maybe I can also look at how maybe can I create systems so the other one get two gamjons. Yeah. Uh, it maybe sounds destructive, but but uh, this is the way the sport has developed. Yeah, so definitely. Big key point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, second uh, key point now is is uh, since they changed also to two points uh, to the body, it uh, it has uh, for me it's uh, it feels more like it, it opens up also for the little shorter players the little more explosive players because my thinking the last 10 years has always been to to train uh, my athletes the best way physical then and if you look at Ellen Johansson for example she has been very very powerful yeah. explosive technical we have had the uh, some really great athletes that have uh, had the same, but they they haven't really performed because because the, the sport how it developed until Rio, it became more just a light touch and and it has been uh, about who's the tallest. Many yeah, times. tallest and, and flexible. It, yeah, but yeah, tall and flexible. So so now again this has opened up also new opportunities with, with other fighters and again we have been working a little different again with alien and and so on so this is the maybe the second one that mm -hmm. we've been thinking a little different regarding yeah. that yeah. good excellent yep yeah. okay so um you, you spoke about ellen there i mean what what's what is the life of an elite full-time athlete like i mean what is their schedule like and how many competitions can they compete in and how many of them do you expect your athletes to peak at? Oh, I just want to cry when I hear that question because <laughs> they have uh, they have created a system now that's not it's not working for any coach in the yep. world, any athlete. They just they just add tournaments, tournaments, tournaments. So first of all, the first question: how which tournament to peak on? Who can take a decision? Is, yeah. European Championship most important, or are uh, the first Grand Prix, the second Grand Prix, the third Grand Prix, the Grand Prix final, uh, blah blah. We have so many tournaments. Senior uh, Championship, Olympic weight division. W what tournament are most important? So for me to be a professional sport, we need to have maybe one or two tournaments a year. Yeah, yeah. This is in average all sports. Uh, and we have lost that. So, so the problem is that we need to to create a system where the athletes they 
almost never peaks. They need to be in almost the same shape almost the whole year. So this is as a really big challenge. Yeah. Uh, to keep them away from injuries, to keep them away from sickness, and, and keep the mo- motivation there also. Yeah. Uh, so the question how to train a normal training week for us, we train between 18 and 25 hours. It means uh, maybe 10 to 12 training sessions a week. We try to divide it in uh, the Taekwondo sports specific part is uh, some training are focused on more tactical parts, some technical, some is mainly focused on sparring. Uh, then we the, then we take the physical part that we do aside uh, beside the, the sport specific and, and that means we do maybe between four or five physical training sessions a week. Okay. And that's also divided in uh, conditioning training, uh, aerobic, anaerobic, and uh, we have. Uh, the weightlifting it's uh, some periods we maybe focus more on explosivity some maybe maximum strength some uh, periods actually just to remain <laughs> the same are and keep away from injuries like prehab <laughs> yeah. yeah no no some, definitely some periods we have rehab <laughs> when we look at the the weightlifting and we try to put in also mental training in all this as a as a uh, own training, you know, you need to do it every week. This is how we tr- try to put it in, in the system. Good. And the uh, competition, my friend. Oh my, I don't, I can't even count. You know, I was <laughs> yeah. 25 countries last year. The year before that, I think 26 countries. You know, it's cadet championships, junior, U21, senior. It's uh, G class. It's so many tournaments. So. Yeah, the, no coach. I have met no coach in the world that, that thinks this is a good system and yep. that can create a system that's that's in a professional way good. Okay. So um, we talked about, obviously, the weightlifting there. You'd mentioned about that they do the, their training um, there. So on the subjects of developing, at what age would you suggest or insist that an athlete begins to lift weights? Or do you feel strength is no longer a requirement in Taekwondo? No, I think it's even more important. But maybe okay. we need to, to separate it. How what people discuss maybe before it's more to in- increase the explosivity. Uh, it's, it's always been important. But maybe now it's it's more important to keep the athletes alive. You know, to to keep them away from injuries. If they're gonna manage to do 10, 15 tournaments a year and and live this life, you know, they they need to be physical, perfect shape. Yeah, uh, but uh, the recommendation is to start maybe age eight nine uh, with weightlifting with weights. But uh, again, it's uh, for me it's technical training the first years. Yeah. Technical training, uh, stability, uh, the very fast learning. Uh, it's not about uh, really developing because they they not having they don't have the, the testosterone they they have not fully developed so it's not you can't really focus on developing maximum yeah. strength or so on but but to start with the uh, the basic technical learning and stability yeah so i mean you're you're obviously going to build their training years early so that when they get the testosterone and stuff like that they're ready to to you know go straight ahead and 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 get strong rather than learn the technique they've already done that exactly the problem is that many wait too long and they think actually it's dangerous yeah when I was young, they, they, they taught me that, oh, if you lift in weights, you, you stop growing and blah, blah, blah. I mean, all scientific say the opposite yeah. now. The bones get stronger, the ligaments get stronger, you get better stability, core coordination becoming better. So actually, you you the, the risk to get injured when you get older, you, you it's, yeah, it, it's everything is just positive yeah. but the problem is when people wait too long yeah. if you start working uh, with weightlifting when you're 14 15 you fully develop the muscles is there so the the power increase so fast but the body you don't have the technical you don't have the core stability mm-hmm. so then the injury is coming because then then the body has not uh, been doing this stuff we, we say that you need two three years with uh, the technical uh, training mm-hmm. before you start really pushing. 
So this is, uh, and, and I understand why people can do it because of course you can't just send in eight kids by themselves in the gym. Yeah. Then you need a coach that maybe can work with them also. But so so you can maybe blame that you don't have time or resources to do it. But if you have, I recommend everybody to start as early as possible. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, so. I'm guessing that lots of our listeners come from various points of their martial arts journey. Um, some beginners, some in the middle, and I'm sure maybe one or two athletes, and possibly some coaches as well. Um, do you think it's important at a young age, developing uh, sorry, a young developing age, to completely focus on one sport, taekwondo, or do you feel a mixture is the best way to develop the skills, the mindset, and overall components of fitness to one day then specialise on winning at the sport that we love, taekwondo? I think the question is uh, to answer it like this: If you if you can find a taekwondo club that has a, a wide perspective of what training is is about, then I think you can stuck get get uh, only focus on one sport. For example, we do if we start with this, even the one if you're 11, 12, the train maybe eight, ten times a week. They do so much agility training, uh, jumping, uh, falling down, you know, they do weightlifting, conditioning, flexibility training, coordination training, skipping rope. You have a lot of variation. And this, I think, is the most important to keep the motivation and, and to work with the whole body. Yeah. It's not about, I think, to specialize in one area. If you start with Olympic and we jump in one, one leg, tuck, 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 and, and do it monotonely, then I think it, it's very, very bad in a long perspective. So if you can't uh, have a, a wide perspective on, on, on the training, uh, do complex training, then I think the best is, of course, that you do a lot of sports at the same time. So, what what was your experience of getting a black belt in Taekwondo? What you, you've told us earlier that you started at the age of fourteen. Um, do you feel that people doing Taekwondo now have a harder or easier journey? I think it is so. It, this is also a problem with with this sport because there is no real structure. If you look just in Sweden, some receive the black belt after three years. Some receive it after eight years. Some. Uh, they need to do know both traditional and Olympic. Some only need to know traditional. Some only need to Olympic. Uh, so there is no real structure, and uh, I can't see that that it's any big difference from from when I started. This has always been different, uh, but uh, it's mainly up to the club to set a structure. Uh, if I could wish, I think the black belt, yellow belt. This is education. You should have something else that you that you uh, te- teaching. Maybe if it's pumps or self defense or boxing or uh, whatever. So for me, the belts should symbolize something else. Uh, and we try to actually have the system like that in our club also. Yeah. And I think also my dream would be that it would be some kind of standardization of this, and even a dream that take away belts in Olympic taekwondo. Uh, set the red and blue belt like they do in, in some other sports Okay. okay. Yeah. Red, red and blue hogo, red and blue belt finished <laughs> <coughs> right okay yeah yeah. that's interesting yeah definitely okay um, so we both come from small countries um, do you feel it is easy to compete with the large nations in the world I know the UK is well funded due to Olympic success what about Sweden do you feel there's more that could be done to help athletes, maybe small countries coming together? I know you've yeah. done this in the past. Yeah, and this is the sad part with our sport also because it, we don't have the, the media that, that uh, write about us. Uh, we can't see Taekwondo in media. And, and if we're not in media, you know, we don't have, there is no really big interest for the sport. The people will not go to a competition. They will not go 10,000 people and watch it because they don't know what it is. Uh, they will not uh, bet on it, gamble yeah. on it. They will not uh, uh, sponsor it, the company owners. So, and to, to look at how they create now the system, they create a system for, for uh, the ones with the money. 
And uh, if I just look in Sweden, it it's, doesn't matter what kind of knowledge you have as a coach. Uh, if you can't work full time with it, if you, your athlete can't work full time with it, and if you don't afford to go to these 10, 15 tournaments, you can never become an elite athlete. Yeah. It doesn't matter what qualities you have, how good knowledge you have. So in the end, it has become also a lot about money. Um, and you can you can complain about it or you do something about it. And we have tried to do something about it. We create business mm -hmm. uh, to bring in money so we can actually afford to, to help athletes to reach the highest level. Uh, small countries don't normally they don't have the the money support from the nations. Swedish Taekwondo Federation is like many other nations; they don't have money. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to support both cadets, juniors, seniors, U21. Yeah. Uh, many Olympic federations don't really see the value in Taekwondo. Sadly, uh, even in Sweden, they don't see the full value on it. Uh, we have had a lot of support, but now even after Rio, they cut the support. Uh, and that, that makes us really vulnerable, because we, if we don't have the money, it's impossible to create top athletes. So I think uh, a lot of countries suffer, uh, suffer the same way. And I don't really have an easy, easy answer how to, to solve it. My only recommendation is up to the club. Start thinking like a company. Mm -hmm. How to bring money. Not just about how to train. <laughs> we need to have the combination. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so, saying that, which country would you say is leading the way in the senior game of Taekwondo? And what is it that gives them the edge? Uh, if we look at the, the big mass, because you can see it in two ways. You see it the, quali uh, the, the quantity, uh, quantity slash quality, or you see just the quality. Yeah. One way it's very hard to, to shoot one, because if you look at top six athletes, it's not that big difference. If you look in Turkey, how many top six they have? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I not really know the number. How many have China? How many have UK? How many have you know, big nations. Yeah. Small. Maybe they have between one to three. Mm -hmm. Some maybe have four. Sweden have two. Uh, they have small nations that have also two players. You know, Belgium have two and, and small countries. So in the top, top six or eight, it's, it's almost the same. But if you look in top 32, then you see clearly the, the, the red line between the ones that have maybe... 15 people in the Grand Prix system, top mm -hmm. 30. It's it's the nations with money. Yeah, the nations that that can have full support team, not just two players. They can support 20 players. They can go to all tournaments, well funded. Maybe even pay salary. Maybe even pay when they take a medal. They they uh, support the medal. You know. So then I can see clear clear uh, red line the ones the top then you can see turkey they can then you can see china then you can see iran then you can see great britain that's well funded but top top level it's a little the same yeah yeah no okay that's good yeah um so for for people looking to improve is there any resources that you would recommend or training camps around the world you feel could help them on their global or on their goal to Olympic gold. Oh, that's a. Um, it's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question, but but to be honest, I think the the main thing is that you need to be open-minded and able to develop, to do new things, because if you do what you did yesterday, then anyway you're gonna become a loser because it develops so fast. It's not just uh, the sport; it's the world. Uh, so this is the first thing that open your eyes and wake up every morning and think what can I do different today it you don't need to to change a whole system from one day to another but you need to do small changes every day every week every year you need to be fast in adopting to new rules and to be able to follow all rule change, because they made them every second month, they do some small rule change. 
for me to to try to be in so many tournaments as many tournaments as, as possible be at the head of team meetings look at youtube uh, you need to be a little nerd to be able to reach the highest level this is maybe i think the first steps for everybody yeah okay and and it's then also i would say one more thing mark uh, when you, if you just have a small amount of money to invest i would rather invest it into going to training camps than to invest in tournaments yeah. many i think do do completely wrong that way because if you have bad luck you lose the first game then you have seen the airport, you invest a lot of money, you've been sitting in a competition arena, you lost the first game, then home. Yeah. You have almost no learning, you have gained almost nothing. But if you invest the same money to go for a weekend for a training camp, you come home maybe with 50 IDs or 10 or 100 IDs. So if you have a limited amount of money, invest them in, in training camps instead. Go and train with other teams, other nations. Yeah. Okay. And and the the Sweden have training camps. Do they do they invite people to come along, or is it just a closed closed uh, door? We don't we don't have uh, have we haven't had that culture. Okay. But uh, I think to be honest, it's not just to to lift myself. But the only real club that has worked structured with that is 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 the Sushim. Yeah. And uh, we made a great, great international camp this summer called Next Level. We have a, le- a lot of Olympic fighters here. It was a good gathering. So <laughs> this, I of course, if I can uh, hear in, in this podcast, invite you. Everybody, welcome. Yeah, well, what I'll try and do is um, when we put the podcast up, we'll, we'll put the link to that training camp if you want on our website. Sure. Okay. Love, love it, yeah. Excellent. So one last question. All right, and this is an interesting question. Um, what is it that makes Taekwondo different to other martial arts, and how would you describe what it takes to be a black belt? Oof, okay, I'm going to try to summarize it shortly. For me, I think that, that the big difference in Taekwondo has been, for me, it, it has been uh, speed and action. Speed and action, same time as it has not been about creating blood, you know, killing people. That has meant that it's a sport for everyone. Uh, some martial art you need, uh, you need maybe to, to be very, very special mindset to be able to take all the beating. But this is a good combination. The speed, the agility, the complexity of the sport, and uh, gather with also that it, it's a human sport, you know. Uh, I try to to make a little bit comparison to uh, maybe Olympic fencing you need to be uh, very very tactical and smart and trying to you know search the hit points. So also that uh, Taekwondo developing very very fast. I can't find any other martial art that has had this development that has, that Taekwondo have had. So this I think is is a uh, is a very very good thing overall for this sport. Yeah. And the second thing to to uh, be a black belt. I think uh, the main thing is that you need to to be able to to handle tough situation. You need to have a structure, not to give up. Uh, you need to decide. Everybody can be a black belt. To be honest, but you need to have the mindset for it. You need to work many, many years. You need to be able to to uh, struggle. So uh, that's also a cool thing that everybody actually can reach it with the right mindset. Yep, I totally agree. Yeah. So, so Nicholas, thank you very much for um, for this interview. I'm wondering how how can people get in touch with you um, or your center? What's the easiest way to get in touch with you? Uh, nowadays, we actually worked yesterday with a social media policy <laughs> for <Okay>. the club. <laughs> I would recommend Facebook, Nicholas Anderson, search for Su Shim. But of course, we have a web page also, www.sushim.se, but, but social media. Yeah, Everybody okay. Everybody can find me there and, and feel free to contact me. Okay, we'll put the links for that as well on the, on the, um, on the podcast page as well. So that's, that's brilliant. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. And uh, I'll speak again sometime soon. Thank you. So if you'd like to hear more interviews about Taekwondo, 
Don't forget to subscribe, like and leave a comment on iTunes. Um, also, you can check out our website on www.focusontaekwondo.com for all the links and more information on the podcast. Mm-hmm.